William Broyles Jr., writer and creator of the television series China Beach, wrote the following in a New York Times article marking 50 years since the first withdrawal of troops from Vietnam in 1969. In the summer of 1969, the first American troops were withdrawn from Vietnam. Their war was over, but mine was just beginning. The previous November, Richard M. Nixon had been elected president with a secret plan to end the war. Surely peace was near. That same month, I received my draft notice. About 24,000 of the more than 58,000 Americans killed in Vietnam were yet to die. I didn't want to be one of them. No one did. 1969 started as other previous years for the 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery in Vietnam. Soldiers finished their tours and left for home, and their replacements arrived and took up their places. Alpha and Headquarters Battery were based at Quan Loi. Charlie Battery was at Phuc Vinh. Bravo Battery was at Phuc Binh. And F Battery, 16th Artillery, was at Tong Le Shan, soon to move to Quan Loi. The mission for Alpha and F Battery was changed to be in support of the 1st Cav Division, while Bravo and Charlie Battery's mission remained with two field forces artillery. This would turn out to be a different year for the battalion, as you will soon see, with direct combat with VC and NVA troops. The damage done in the previous years to supply routes via Cambodia must have convinced the North's leadership to decide to try to knock out the big guns at two of the battalion's fire bases. According to the official battalion history, the new year, 1969, saw a continued emphasis being placed on gun crew drill and FDC section training. A gunnery evaluation team was organized with the battalion operations section. The evaluation team was to conduct monthly inspections of each firing battery assist each unit in developing sound gunnery procedures and the detecting of errors and procedures. By eliminating mechanical, mental, and physical faults, the team would be a safeguard against artillery incidents and an insurance of safe, responsive, timely, and accurate artillery fire. On the 2nd of January, 1969, the battalion fired its 300,000th round. An appropriate ceremony was conducted and the round was dedicated to the E.W. Thurston Junior High School, whose students had collected and sent Christmas gifts to the soldiers at Quan Loi the previous Christmas. A citation and appropriate battalion plaque commemorating the event were sent to the students and faculty of the Thurston Junior High. You have to wonder if this is displayed anywhere in the school today. At the beginning of 1969, Battery F, 16th Artillery, was located at Tong Le Shan, Republic of Vietnam. You may recall that Battery F was attached to the 6th of the 27th Artillery on November 30th, 1968. On 28 February 1969, with the closing of the 1st Cav Division operations in the area of the Fish Hook, Battery F, 16th Artillery moved from Tong Le Shan to the Quan Loi Base Camp. The personnel and equipment were transported by C-130 aircraft. The firing battery initially occupied a former 105 mm howitzer position at Quan Loi and then moved into their new location. On 25 March 1969, the battery rear departed Phuc Vinh and all elements of Battery F were together at Quan Loi for the first time since November 1, 1968. On 13 March 1969, the 1st Brigade of the 1st Infantry Division returned to Quan Loi and assumed responsibility for the area. Once again, the 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery, faced the situation of supporting the tactics and procedures of another division. Extensive coordination with the 1st Brigade was required because of numerous personnel changes and a four-month period of disassociation with the Brigade. Immediately, artillery liaison was established with the direct support rendered by batteries A and F to the brigade at Quan Loi. Both batteries had their missions changed to GSR 1st Infantry Division artillery and began rendering valuable firepower to the 1st Brigade maneuver elements. 
During the period of March 18th to the 26th, 1969, the battalion was involved in Operation Atlas Wedge, a platoon of 8-inch howitzers from Battery A displaced by convoy to Fire Support Base Thunder 3 to participate in a multi-division operation in the vicinity of the Michelin Rubber Plantation. An old friend, the late Gary Graham, wrote a memory story of his participation in Operation Atlas Wedge for the website Quanloy.org called Convoying on Thunder Road. I quote from his story. The date is late March 1969. The 8-inch howitzer platoon of Alpha Battery 6 to the 27th Artillery has been at Fire Support Base Thunder 3 for about two weeks, supporting the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment and some of the units of the 1st Infantry Division during Operation Atlas Wedge. Our job is finished and the time has come to return to Quan Loy, the location of the 175mm gun platoon of the battery. When compared to Fire Support Base Thunder 3, LZ Andy or Quan Loy does not seem to be too bad a place. So we are ready to depart. The other units at Fire Support Base Thunder 3 don't shed a tear, either as we are leaving. We have been told that our howitzers make a lot of noise when they fire, and they have been firing most of the time since we arrived. As the platoon is getting loaded and ready to convoy, elements of the 2nd of the 2nd Mechanized Infantry of the 1st Infantry Division arrive at the fire support base. They have the job of security for the convoy. Moreover, the word is that the convoy will get ambushed on the way back to Quan Loy. All of the persons in the caravan hope the word isn't correct. Gary did make it back to Quan Loy after some harrowing experiences. He concludes his story as follows. As we arrive, I know that a cold beer awaits me along with a shower and a clean uniform. As I climb out of the van, one of the FTC crew members takes my picture. He later gives me the print, and I send it to my family. My mother carries it with her the remainder of the time I am in Vietnam. She says that particular picture is the happiest that she has ever seen me. The truth of the statement is that she is correct. On April 15, 1969, a platoon of 155 howitzers from Battery F 16th Artillery was displaced to Loch Ninh Special Forces Camp to be in direct support of a Special Forces Camp Strike Force operation. The move of the howitzers and trucks was by rotary wing, three CH-54 sorties and three CH-47 sortie from Quan Loy. Necessary supplies were flown by C-130 aircraft from Benoit to Loch Ninh. The platoon supported a combat assault by the Camp Strike Force and provided support for two days. On 17 April 69, the platoon returned to Quan Loy by C-130. Operation Montana Scout, 23 April to 12 May, saw the battalion once again involved in a complex military operation. A platoon of 8-inch howitzers from Battery A displaced by convoy from Quan Loy to LZ Joe near Min Tha to provide heavy artillery support for elements of the 1st Cav Division. The operation was very successful because of the heavy artillery's devastating firepower on jungle base camps deep in War Zone C. In many engagements, it was the close artillery support of Battery A that prevented U.S. forces from receiving heavy fire by enemy firmly entrenched in well-constructed bunker complexes. At 1 a.m. on May 12, 1969, Quan Loy Base Camp, also known as LZ Andy, began to receive an intense mortar and rocket attack. Ground probes by NVA Viet Cong sappers were able to penetrate the wire in the area between perimeter guard bunkers 62 and 70 
on the southeast side of the camp. Several of the bunkers received direct hits from B-40 rocket-propelled grenade rounds and satchel charges. This, however, was a diversionary tactic, as the main attack was on the west side of the base camp, where Alpha Battery and Headquarters Battery, 6th of the 27th Artillery, were located. At the same time, sappers entered the west side of the camp through the wire between bunkers 15 and 16, just inside the perimeter road. A Company, 1st of the 2nd Infantry, a mortar platoon, had recently set up their camp just outside headquarters and Alpha Battery's positions. The barbed wire fence surrounding the 6th of the 27th positions had been left open so members of A Company could more easily get to the 6th of the 27th mess hall. It was here that several sappers crept into A Company's position, dropping satchel charges into their personnel bunkers. Ten of A Company's young soldiers died from the explosions of these satchel charges. These soldiers, who never realized what hit them, were Specialist for Ernest T. Freeman of Morgantown, Pennsylvania Specialist for Ronald L. Gray, Mantino, Illinois Specialist for Robert D. Lewis, Jeffersonville, Indiana Specialist for Raymond F. Norvell, Phoenix, Arizona Specialist for Cecil W. Queen, Taylor, Texas Specialist for Charles G. Stoltz, Quinoma, Kansas PFC Gary A. Corey, Oakland, California PFC David E. Demings, Wewoka, Oklahoma PFC Donald W. Garrett, Conyers, Georgia PFC Lawrence D. Harvey, Greeley, Nebraska Edmund F. Zeruski, Headquarters Battery related in his memory story of the May 12th attack. He wrote, So, now we crawl into the mortar platoon area. It must have been just moments before everyone else. When we first went into the wire, there was a body of a soldier before we got to the first bunker. He was to our left. We didn't check him as we knew he was gone. It looked like the mortar platoon got taken completely by surprise. I guess the sappers got past everyone without being spotted until someone nailed the two by Bunker 8. The sappers were able to then enter the Alpha Battery firing area and attack gun number 4, a 175mm gun, as it sat at the northwestern edge of the battery area. They threw satchel charges onto the gun and the explosions damaged the gun beyond repair. While this took place, the men of headquarters in Alpha Battery fired on the intruders, killing five of them. The late Larry Jamison recalled in his memory story of the May 12th attack at Quan Loi. I remember seeing movement near the wire. At first I thought they were Americans from the mortar platoon. When we realized they were North Vietnamese, we opened fire with our M14s. They had a flamethrower and, and used it to get the gun pad on fire. I remember seeing one of the NVA aim a rocket-propelled grenade at us. He wore khakis and had a beekeeper-type hat on. I can still see him aiming that thing at us as we fired at them. The next thing I remember is hearing the explosion and being on the ground about 20 feet from where I had been. I crawled into the closest ditch. Larry was eventually medevac south and then flown to Japan. His tour of duty in Vietnam was over. Mike Comerford with Alpha Battery remembered, When we got there, the first thing we saw was one of the mortar platoon guys bending over one of his fallen comrades. He had a lot of blood on him and he was sobbing. He said it was his best friend laying there who was dead. We asked him if he was badly wounded and he said he wasn't. It was mostly other people's blood on him. We asked him where the most badly wounded were, and he said everyone seriously wounded had already been taken away. He calculated there were only maybe four guys not dead or seriously wounded in the whole platoon. We told him to lie down on the stretcher, and we would carry him over to the aid station. He refused, asking us to take his dead friend instead. 
As we picked his friend up, he told us that his friend was a brand new father and would never see his child. He said the platoon never had a chance. The gooks had cotton in and thrown satchel charges in their bunkers while they were still asleep. Most of them hadn't time to even grab their weapons. A majority of his platoon had been wiped out in about 60 seconds. Thompson and I made about three trips back and forth. By the last trip, most of the bodies of the mortar platoon had been loaded in the back of a truck. An officer told us we could go back to our gun section. Our sad duty was over. That night, our side lost 22 killed in action and 94 wounded in action at Quan Loi. Fortunately for Alpha and Headquarters batteries, they suffered only four wounded and no killed in action. At approximately 3.30 in the morning that same day, Bravo Battery, located at Phuc Bin, came under heavy ground attack. Early detection of two attacking columns of VC and rapid deployment of artillerymen around the camp perimeter stopped the main attack. The battery provided self-illumination with its 81mm mortars. 28 VC were killed in the perimeter wire, 2 VC surrendered, and large quantities of arms and equipment were captured to include flamethrowers, radios, and Bangalore torpedoes. A careful search of the area found a VC command post and wire lines indicating a well-coordinated VC attack had been defeated. Of little or no historical importance, other than he is the guy that is bringing you this video history, John Wavre arrived at Quan Loi in Alpha Battery, 6th to the 27th Artillery, on May 20th, 1969. Just 24 days later, on the night of June 5, 1969, Quan Loi experienced another ground attack. Both headquarters and Alpha Battery deployed reaction forces that prevented penetration into the battery areas, although the base camp perimeter wire had been breached. Ten NVA were killed, short of the battery wire, and four NVA wounded in action were captured. Mike Comerford with Alpha Battery remembered that night. After the attack on May 12, 1969, the guard bunker on top of gun number 4's Projo bunker had been reinforced. A chain link RPG fence was placed in front of it, and the area where their mortar platoon had been hit was bulldozed, giving number 4 a more clear firing zone in the event of a ground attack. I was on guard in that bunker the night of June 5, 1969 with Jan McClaga from number four gun section. Rain clouds hovered above, and as light rain began to fall slowly down, we put on our ponchos. It was so dark we couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of us, and the sound of the falling rain made it clearly impossible to hear. It must have been around midnight when a trip flare went off and rockets started landing. Now June 6th. Shortly all hell broke loose. Somebody popped a flare, and I remember McClaga saying, My God, look at all of them. They're like ants. Almost immediately, Jim Moore from number four came up the ladder to help. We cranked the 50 cal up and fired a burst. I was on the left side, McClaga in the middle feeding, and Moore was guarding our open side by the ladder. So if anyone got through, he could pick them off before they could blindside us. There were aiming sticks jutting up out of the sandbags, and though I had a very wide range of motion with the 50 caliber, I tried to be careful to stay between the sticks for fear of hitting one of the other bunkers. As morning approached, I remember telling McClaga that I had never been so tired in my life. At dawn, we saw the destruction in front of us. One of the infantry guys in the bunker just forward and to the side of us had been killed, and sadly, we heard Brubaker in the bunker on the other side had also lost his life to an RPG. I didn't know him personally, but have thought about him many times over the years. I will never forget how cool McClaga and Moore were the whole time we were under attack. The men of number four gun section gave a great account of themselves, and after that I felt much safer every night when I lay down to sleep, knowing those guys on number four were on the perimeter of our battery between me and the enemy. 
Sometime after midnight, I was in the Kamo trailer with the operator, whose name I cannot recall, online with the other batteries when we heard the muffled sound of incoming rockets. Service battery relayed that somewhere on Longbin they were getting hit and they had to get off the air. We advised him that we too were getting hit and signed off. As I stepped out of the rig, I heard the sound of small arms and I knew we were under another ground attack. At almost the same instant, I heard someone calling for the medic. Not long after that, I saw someone moving behind the mess hall. With the light of flares, I could see it was one of our guys. And I asked, who got zapped? His answer, his answer took me by surprise. Brubaker, he yelled back. I thought he would say someone got some shrapnel or some other minor injury. No, one of our comrades had been killed. This was for real. Later, I talked to b -son. I don't recall his given name, and he told me that an RPG had hit the chain link fence and went off like it was supposed to, but a piece of shrapnel had caught Brubaker in the head. He said that he had just bent down to get another belt for the M60 when it happened. The number of enemy killed was great, but this time we lost very few men. Headquarters Battery 6 of the 27th, however, lost a good friend that night, though in Robert Brubaker's death. Robert Michael Brubaker was the 8th casualty of the 6th of the 27th Artillery in Vietnam. He was on guard duty the night of June 5th on Old Bunker No. 8 in Headquarters Battery at Quan Loi, when early in the morning of June 6, 1969, NVA sappers breached the perimeter wire once again between perimeter bunkers 16 and 17. One of the sappers fired an M40 rocket-propelled grenade. The RPG fence blocked the RPG, but a piece of the shrapnel broke through the fence, hitting Sergeant Brubaker in the head, instantly killing him. The ground attack was repulsed by a number of brave souls, both from Headquarters Battery and Alpha Battery, 6th of the 27th Artillery, that night. On June 23, 1969, the 1st Infantry Division departed from Quan Loi and passed responsibility for the area to the 1st Cavalry Division. The mission of Alpha Battery and Battery F 16th Artillery changed to the 1st Cav, while the mission of Bravo and Charlie Batteries remained with two Field Forces Artillery. Sometime around the period May to July 1969, the battalion received M16 rifles and turned in their M14s. This was a new experience and the troops were warned to keep the 16s clean or they would jam. On 27 July 1969, Lieutenant Colonel Leonard F. B. Reed Jr. assumed command of the battalion, succeeding Lieutenant Colonel Richard S. Bullock. Immediately, Colonel Reed faced the myriad of duties and responsibilities involved in leading the largest artillery battalion in South Vietnam. During the hours between 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock a.m., the morning of 12 August 1969, LZ Andy Quan Loi received an unknown number of RPG 82mm mortar and 107 rocket rounds, AK-47 rifle fire, automatic weapons fire, and five ground probes by an estimated 800 to 1,000 NVA VC infantry and a VC Sapper Company. The main attack was directed at the southeast perimeter, where an estimated enemy force of 200 NVA VC channeled their attack on a complex of five bunkers. They were beaten back by automatic weapons and small arms fire from personnel of the 11th ACR, with ground and aerial rocket artillery and U.S. Air Force spooky support. In the course of the Vietnam War, American aircraft flew almost 14 million sorties. These were some of the warplanes used. Phantom, Corsair, Intruder, F-111, Thunder Chief, B-52, Skyhawk, and Puff the Magic Dragon, also known as Spooky, a transport plane equipped with three Gatling guns, each capable of firing 6,000 rounds a minute. It flew at night to avoid ground fire, but carried flares to light up enemy positions. Puff was especially valuable in defending bases against nighttime attack. 
At approximately the same time, an estimated 70 to 80 NVA VC enemy breached the base camp perimeter wire west of Headquarters Battery and Alpha Battery, 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery. The enemy force penetrated towards the battery's perimeter wire, but was stopped by personnel of Headquarters Battery and Alpha Battery. Numerous other ground probes were reported from bunkers around the perimeter. At 0600 hours, a sniper located west of Battery A's position fired across the battery area and into the battalion's tactical operations center. A reactionary force from Alpha Battery spotted and killed the sniper. Enemy casualties were 73 NVA VC killed in action and seven NVA VC POWs. Friendly casualties were three killed in action and 23 wounded in action. Only four wounded in action were personnel of the 6th to the 27th Artillery. Staff Sergeant Thomas L. Mathis was a member of the 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry of the 1st Infantry Division on the night of August 12, 1969. Here is a bit of his memory of that night. Alpha Troop 1st of the 4th Cavalry had been working around Quan Loi for a couple of weeks in early August. We had been doing sweeps from the northwest, south, and southeast of the base. I was not told what or why we were so active in the area. Most of us were unaware that a large offensive was suspected and the area around Quan Loi was a prime target. I assume intelligence was aware of this as I look on our actions in retrospect. According to the Battle of Binh Long Province, August 1969, a study produced by the 1st Cavalry Division History Unit on August 2, 1969, the 1st Cavalry re-interviewed a recent Chu Hoi, who at first claimed he was a laborer for the NVA and transporting goods, but because of his good treatment under the Chu Hoi program, had decided to tell the truth. He talked of a large NVA operation by the VC's 9th Division and elements of the NVA 1st and 7th Division that would be directed at Anlock, Lok Min, Budok, and Quan Loi between 5 August and 15 August. Headquarters were skeptical, but decided to proceed with the plans to defend these four locations. As August 12th grew near, to the men of headquarters and Alpha batteries, it appeared to be the same as the day before and most personnel did not know of the suspected attack. At 0105 hours the morning of August 12th, Guan Loi started taking enemy mortar and B-40s on bunker number 61, and very shortly it was discovered the enemy was inside the wire on the west side of the LZ. He eventually broke through at a total of three locations, the other two being one on the western side and a second on the eastern side. Sharp fighting raged both inside and outside of the perimeter all night. A great part of the credit for the successful defense of Quan Loi that night must also go to the second platoon of Alpha 1st of the 4th Cav, which in its screening position two kilometers to the south of Quan Loi, sustains a ferociously heavy ground attack beginning at 0115 hours. They engaged an enemy force of battalion size for two hours without any kind of support. This one platoon in all probability stopped the enemy attack from reaching the gap in the wire on the eastern side of Quan Loi in time. By 0315 hours, ammunition was so low that they figured they were only 30 minutes from being overrun. A blue max showed up, however, and the shoe was on the other foot the enemy quickly left the scene, followed by the Cobras shooting in battle. The Huey Cobra proved itself more survivable than the basic troop carrier for its combination of performance and small size offered the communist forces a minimal target. The AH-1 was thus one of the major U.S. successes of the Vietnam War. 
and the type has remained in service since that time, successive marks adding new features and increasing performance. Huey Cobra's most important weapon is the 2.75 inch rocket and a full complement of these devastating high velocity weapons has the same effect as a 38 gun howitzer barrage. If you recall, Staff Sergeant Thomas L. Mathis was a member of the 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry of the 1st Cavalry Division on the night of August 12, 1969. Here he continues his account. Alpha Troop at full strength consisted of three platoons of three M48 tanks, six A cabs, and about 30 men, as well as another eight or so men and three vehicles of headquarters armored vehicles. On the night of August 12th, we were deployed in a screening fashion with 1st Platoon two clicks south and west of Quan Loi, 2nd Platoon east of Quan Loi on road 303, and headquarters in the 3rd Platoon south of Quan Loi. My platoon, 1st, was sitting around the strong point we had made in the middle of the road when the fireworks began around Quan Loi. We knew they were getting a ground attack. Lots of tracers, illumination, and gunships around Quan Loi let us know it was a pretty good attack. Around 2400 hours, the second platoon east of Quan Loi began to see images in the starlight scope. They engaged the images and the fight began to develop. Slow at first, as if the NVA really didn't want to fight, but had been caught in a night movement. The fight developed without assistance for a while due to radio malfunctions of the platoon sergeant. There was no platoon leader, first lieutenant, with them that night. The second battled the NVA for at least an hour before a gunship passing overhead was able to pick up their radio and relay it to our CO. The third platoon and headquarters immediately reinforced the second platoon. After another 30 minutes, the first platoon was asked to join the battle. Each platoon moved east down road 303 to the site of the second platoon reconning by fire as we approached the battle. We fought the NVA until almost daybreak. We were unable to get artillery or gunship assistance until about 4 a.m. due to a concentration of support around Quan Loi. At about 5 o'clock, the battle began to cool. Sporadic fire would crank up as NVA attempted to escape the site. We had expended approximately 150 tank canister rounds, 40,000 rounds of 50 caliber machine gun ammo, and probably 100,000 rounds of 30 caliber M16, Claymores, M79 grenades, etc. We had lost two KIA and about eight wounded. We policed up about 30 NVA bodies. There were many heroes that night. The press gave wide distribution to a group of eight medics. The widely distributed Associated Press report stated, Moving with skill, speed, and daring in the flickering half-light of battle, three Viet Cong sappers cut through the wire, slipped past the defenders in Bunker 61, and crawled 150 yards up a drainage tunnel to the edge of the rubber trees. There, in a 20-minute fight, eight American medics stopped the intruders and virtually decided the Battle of Quan Loi. I guess if we hadn't been there, there would have been a lot more casualties, shrugged PFC Bobby Cooper. The AP article read further, Both officers and men of this 3,000-man 1st Air Cavalry Division post agreed by halting the deepest enemy penetrations along the perimeter. The medics thwarted an attack on the command bunker that could have knocked out communications and changed the course of the battle. If you will allow me a personal memory of that night, I went to my assigned bunker that faced the airstrip as I was previously ordered. From that position, I thought it was just another practice alert until I could tell all hell was breaking loose across the firing battery on the west perimeter. I had been on guard duty the night before on the guard bunker furthest inside our wire on the west perimeter. This was the same bunker Staff Sergeant Robert Smith so bravely manned a 60 caliber and defended the battery from being overrun. 
He certainly deserved at least a bronze star for his actions, but never received it. Perhaps it was because he left the very next day to go home. His tour of duty in Vietnam was over. Seven Americans lost their lives in this fighting, one of them aircraft commander of a Cobra gunship that took a direct hit from a 107 millimeter rocket. But over 55 enemy dead were left behind and seven prisoners were taken. Just so you have an idea of the size of Quan Loi, Quan Loi was three kilometers long and 1.5 kilometers wide. A drive around the inside perimeter wire would take you roughly nine kilometers. It had 82 bunkers and nine towers that comprised the perimeter. It was a hell of a place to try to defend. This August 12th attack on Quan Loi was the last ground attack while Americans controlled the base camp. For whatever reasons, perhaps the shellacking they took on this day convinced the NVA VC to not try it again. As one of the first cab troopers was heard to comment upon searching a particularly dead enemy soldier. Man, for this Charlie, the 12th of August was the 12th of never. Be that as it may, the soldiers stationed on the perimeter guard bunkers were jittery and on edge for the next few days after the August 12th attack. Nobody knew for sure if the NVA VC would try it again, go for another attack. As a precaution against another attack on Quan Loi, extra men, as many as 20, were part of a reactionary force ready to move to the perimeter where needed. Some of the bunkers were not used for the next few days and the guards were combined to every third bunker or so. Thirteen men manned Bunker 18 on the night of August 19, 1969. At approximately at 0130, the early morning of August 19, 1969, one or more of these soldiers on Bunker 18 thought they saw something in the wire and all 13 soon opened fire into the darkness where it was thought there had been movement. They fired M16s and M79 grenade rounds for several minutes. A Sherman tank was assigned to the west side of the perimeter in reserve since the previous three ground attacks had taken place on the west perimeter. The Sherman was ready to fire into the perimeter wire if needed with a beehive round containing thousands of flechettes in its loaded shell. No one knows for sure. It was rumored that one of the tower guards closest to Bunker 18 reported that the bunker had been overrun, seeing all the activity of shooting by the guards on the top of the bunker. Remember, it was dark and everyone on guard duty that night was uneasy. Hearing this report that Bunker 18 had been overrun from the report of the tower guard, the Sherman rumbled down the road to Bunker 18 and fired the VI round directly into the bunker spraying 8,000 flashettes from less than 45 meters. The flashettes killed nine GIs and wounded four others. Four of the nine were regular grunts, three worked in the laundry, and one was a cook. All nine were just unlucky to have been chosen for perimeter guard duty that night. As the gossip also spread, the tower guard, whose report had caused the Sherman tank to fire on the bunker, was supposedly shipped out of Quan Loi that same day. The official report stated the incident was an accident. As the Sherman moved towards Bunker 18, the tank hit a bump and bounced, causing the gunner to accidentally fire the round into the bunker. That's probably a better story than actually placing blame on one individual. Regardless, whichever story was true, it was a terrible tragedy at Quan Loi on the night of August 19, 1969. In November 1969, the 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery, a composite 8-inch 175mm Howitzer Battalion and its attached 155mm Artillery Firing Battery, Battery F, 16th Artillery, were recommended for a meritorious unit citation, an MUC or a MUC, for service performed during the period 1 February to 31 August 1969 for supporting numerous combat operations in the Republic of Vietnam and an active participation in an aggressive civic action program. In supporting U.S. and Arvin forces during this seven-month span, the battalion fired 87,233 rounds of 155mm 
175mm and 8-inch ammunition during 25,355 missions without a single artillery incident. During this period, the battalion was credited with 192 NVA VC confirmed killed by artillery, 98 possible killed by artillery, 614 bunkers destroyed, and 88 secondary explosions. The battery sustained 194 enemy rocket, mortar, and ground attacks, receiving an estimated total of 2,147 rounds, causing 3 killed in action and 45 wounded in action among personnel of the battalion. The battalion's civic action program provided support, assistance, and guidance for the Vietnamese people. Two Girl Scouts and two Boy Scout troops were established. A mountain yard boarding school was built, and a vigorous MedCAPS program was inaugurated in conjunction with the MACV advisors and province health teams. In February 1970, the recommendation for the meritorious unit citation was killed by Lieutenant General Frank T. Mildren, then Deputy Commanding General of Two Field Force Vietnam. He wrote in a letter, the recommendation for award of the Meritorious Unit Commendation 1st Oakleaf Cluster to the 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery, for meritorious achievement during the period 1 February 1969 to 31 August 1969 is not favorably considered. Although the unit displayed devotion to duty and performed its mission commendably, the stringent requirements for award of the Meritorious Unit Commendation were not fulfilled. I'll let you be the judge of whether or not he was correct in his judgment. In conclusion, it should not be construed that it was only Alpha Battery and Headquarters Batteries that were the only troopers to fight off ground attacks at Quan Loi. All those stationed at Quan Loi in 1969 did their part in stopping the ground attacks by the NVA VC. Nor should anyone think that Bravo, Charlie, or Service Batteries did not have their share of incoming rounds and dangerous missions throughout the year. This video history concentrated on the ground attacks on Quan Loi because that is what is documented the most for the 6th of the 27th Artillery for the year 1969 in Vietnam.